Use me little log. <clears throat> Hi guys. Good lord, do we have a windy, stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization where it is the, what is it, is it the third day of spring? I think it is Thursday. Good God Almighty. It is Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. And so as the storm blows in, do they should all stay to Texas? Uh, okay, guys, I've been dropping a couple of hints that I need to do a review of this lovely, beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmler. Uh, there are reports coming to my attention that somebody else on YouTube has, uh, is trying to tread on my territory and somewhere else on YouTube today there is a review of breeding sweetgrass. I have not heard it yet so I'd better get out there and get my own uh, version of a... Uh, of a Doomer Reviews Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmler. I want to thank my dear sweet sister for uh, giving this to me. Uh, I think she gave this to me in October and I finally finished it in March and it, it was a little tough for a Doomer to uh, read this and so I, I, I realize I'm treading on very thin ice here guys I'm gonna do my best to uh, to try to somewhat rein it in as I review this uh, uh, this this beautiful book and and before I launch into this before anybody gets any wrong ideas uh, I want to say from the get-go that braiding sweetgrass is an absolutely beautiful, lyrical, almost poetic uh, ode to Mother Earth. This woman, uh, Robin, clearly loves Mother Earth. Obviously, she considers herself a very strong environmentalist. She is, uh, she is both a, a, uh, well, you, you know, a, 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 a noble savage. So she's a noble savage who ended up getting her PhD in botany and now teaches botany at SUNY New York in Syracuse, not far from Bugs in a Jar Farm. Uh, she is an excellent writer. For all I know, this book uh, has even gotten the uh, Pulitzer Prize. I have no doubt that she has a TED Talk uh, that you can go online and find hundreds of reviews. People applauding uh, Robin Wall Kimmler for her magnus opus, Braiding Sweetgrass. Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. This is an absolute, just spellbinding piece of beautiful writing. If I weren't a doomer, or if I could just set aside on a plate, taking, you know, putting my doomer brain and worldview, uh, understanding how doomed we are, and that humans need to go extinct, if I could just put that in, in a canoe and send it off across the, the waters of Lake Onondaga and read this and, and, and just divorce myself from being a doomer, I would give this book five stars. But unfortunately, guys, I can't do that. I am a doomer. I do have a brain. Uh, so, it, 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 as much as this pains me and as much as this is going to get me in trouble, I am very carefully going to tread here and explain 
why uh, why Robin completely failed miserably on on every level to prove her thesis. I think her thesis, uh, if I understand it correctly, was that humans are not necessarily a bad influence on this planet, and if we could just, you, you know, get a little more of that indigenous, uh, you know, noble savage worldview that a planet of eight billion people could just get into the same worldview that was present uh, when it was a planet of, I don't know, 500 million people, perhaps, then uh, we could just go right along being one of many Earthlings living in balance and harmony with Mother Nature and that humans can reciprocate. This is what the main theme of her book is reciprocation, how humans the single biggest threat to life on pl on the planet, by far, bar none, uh, with, with just changing our worldview that we can be ACES, that we can reciprocate, we can get eight billion humans, can give back to this planet everything we are taking from her every year, and um, and just all be one big happy family. There is no reason that this e botanist and ecologist sees. Now, of course, this kind of a spoiler, uh, nowhere in this 400 plus pages do you see the words overshoot or over population. You will not find the two, oh, now you will find overconsumption, okay, that as individuals we are a little bit greedy. Nowhere in here will you find either the words overshoot or overpopulation when this uh, PhD educated botanist slash ecologist is trying to explain to us that humans can be a good influence on the planet. So anyway, guys, like, you know, so she starts out from her noble savage uh, right brain in this that I'm not going to spend because it would take about 12, 15 minutes to read the creation myth uh, of, of her tribe. Uh, I, I will just try to distill it for you. So anyway, like like every other one of these creation myths, these you, you know these uh, Easter Bunny, uh, Santa Claus, Happy Horseshit uh, creation myth stories, it's all about humans. And uh, so essentially, if I understand uh, her creation myth. So what you had was, were all of these animals, they were living in a wetland, some undisclosed wetland, but judging by the species here in, you know, what is now the United States, uh, Turtle Island, probably upstate New York, uh, near Bugs in a Jar Farm. So you have all of these animals, geese and turtles and muskrats and otters and loons and stuff, they're sitting around, minding their own business, going about their business, doing what wetland animals do, uh, just having a fine day, and then out of nowhere, out of the sky, drops a human. A human, sky woman, falls out of the sky, and within five minutes, not even within five minutes, within on impact, on impact, one human, one human with no help from any other humans, completely starts upsetting the apple cart and, and, and just laying waste. So let's say in the first five minutes, she has killed a muskrat. 
Well, I guess a muskrat committed suicide to help her, so she's killed the muskrat and some other unnamed fellow earthlings. She hasn't been there five minutes. Uh, we already have a dead muskrat and, and, and whoever else. And as all of these animals drop everything they are doing to aid and assist this helpless human, that's what she calls it, the helpless human. That, that every other earthling drops everything they're doing dedicates their life to uh, helping out uh, this human and so what she does is immediately starts draining a wetland uh, ecosystem. Uh, you know I have been trying to restore wetland ecosystems in, uh, in New York you know to help the muskrat anyway. Uh, so She's been there five minutes, she's already killed several animals, and she immediately sets about draining a wetland. And of course, that has not stopped. What have we drained uh, uh, as humans? Uh, about 95% of our planet's wetlands, which of course are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems. On the planet, you know, I, I'm sitting there uh, reading this creation story and I'm thinking, you know, flip this around and you have a bunch of humans sitting around doing what humans do on an average day and all of a sudden a goose, a goose just falls out of the sky and lands at their feet. What do you think the humans are going to do they're going to grab the goose, they're going to wring its neck, and throw it in the stew pot is what they're going to do with the goose, which is exactly what that group of animals should have done to that first human is stuck her face in the water and drowned her, but they didn't, and look what the hell has happened. So that is the creation myth of her tribe. So she quickly goes from there. <coughs> and uh, so now what she is, is uh, she's, she's, she goes from her right brain over to her left brain. This is a very schizophrenic book. So now she finds herself teaching a, uh, a, a, I guess an ecology class at SUNY New York. <clears throat> Take it away. Uh, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I am usually in a lecture hall at the university expounding about botany and ecology, trying, in short, to explain to my students how Sky Woman's Gardens, known by some, you know, people with, with brains, as global ecosystems function. <clears throat> one, other un, one otherwise unremarkable morning, I gave the students in my general ecology class a survey. Among other things, they were asked to rate their understanding of the negative interactions between humans and the environment. Nearly every one of the 200 students said confidently that humans and nature are a bad mix. <clears throat> These were third year students who had selected a career in environmental protection, so their response was, in a way, not very surprising. They were well schooled in the mechanics of climate change, toxins in the land and water, and the crisis of habitat loss you know, that was started by uh, Sky Woman in the first five minutes of arriving on Earth. You know, that habitat loss that she's talking about. <clears throat> Later in the survey, they were asked to rate, the no to rate their knowledge of positive interactions between people and land. The median response was none, which is exactly the correct response. 
when asked to rate the knowledge of positive interaction between people and land, the correct answer, you don't have to be a third year environmental protection student to know the answer is none. I was stunned. How is it possible that in 20 years of education, they cannot think of any beneficial relationships between people and the environment? Perhaps the negative examples they see every day, brownfields, factory farms, suburban sprawl, truncated their ability to see some good, some good between humans and the earth. As the land becomes impoverished, so does the scope of their vision. When we talked about this after class, I realized they cannot even imagine what beneficial relation between their species and others might look like. How can we begin to move toward ecological and cultural sustainability if we cannot even imagine what the path feels like, if we can't imagine the generosity of geese, hmm. if we can't imagine, I'm sorry, the generosity of geese, these students were not raised on the story of Sky Woman the, uh, you, you know, the, uh, as I say, the uh, Easter Bunny uh, Great Pumpkin story of Sky Woman. So anyway, guys, that, that's pretty much, so her thesis, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, that basically her thesis is this. She is out to prove to her students and anyone reading, uh, braiding sweetgrass that she is going to prove that humans can reciprocate, reciprocate uh, with the planet that we as humans, although she never mentions there's eight billion humans, but we as humans, I guess from an individual level to a species-wide level, can give back to this planet and our fellow earthlings as much as we take from it. And uh, then she spends the next 400 pages completely failing miserably to uh, defend her thesis. And in fact, I would say a about 350 of the 400 pages of this book, she in fact defends the thesis of her, of her students that there is no positive relation between, uh, between humans uh, and the rest of the planet. She gives example after example, chapter after chapter, how humans are completely unsustainable on every single level, how we are a threat to every global ecosystem on the planet and every one of our fellow earthlings. Uh, she, she is an apocaloptimist. She, uh, she understands the apocalypse part of it. And then, you, you know, after doing all this, and then she comes in in the final act, uh, how many times have we heard this uh, about, you, you know, how we're, we're going to turn uh, this freight train around? And, uh, you know, so of course, you know, since she is a noble savage, she continually uh, uses this, uh, this uh, thing about uh, about sprinkling tobacco uh, onto Mother Earth to show uh, our gratitude, that uh, we need to show our gratitude. We, you know, we need to uh, give Mother Earth one swallow of our cup of coffee. We need to give Pachamama 
one swallow of our coffee before we gulp the, the rest of the cup, how we give Mother Earth a, a drag off our cigarette, and uh, I guess this is how you show reciprocity. That, uh, and so you give Mother Earth a drag off your cigarette, and you are absolved. You are absolved is all of, of every bit of your individual guilt uh, of all the damage you have done as one human, and I guess we will, we will collectively absolve uh, our, our damage we've done to this planet over 200,000 years if we can just share our cigarettes and coffee with Mother Earth. I, 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 I'm simply getting fed up with this crap. It's crap. This whole thing uh, about, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with showing gratitude uh, to Mother Earth, uh, but if you, th if you think for one minute that Mother Earth gives a damn about the drag off your cigarette or your, or, or, or your cup of coffee, uh, anyway, I was so uh, it, later in the book. I, I'm, I, I'm I, again. I'm not going to quote it link from here. Just for you can read this book yourself if you dare uh, read this. So, you know she does this chapter on uh, this kind of famous uh, noble savage prayer uh, and, and gratitude. This Thanksgiving prayer where they're thanking. Uh, all of our fellow Earthlings, and, and, and I, I love it how in the prayer they actually talk about one part I, I really enjoyed is where all of these noble savages to assuage their own guilt and to absolve themselves. They're giving thanks to the fish, to all of the fish on the planet for doing their duty of giving themselves as food to humans, that it is a fish's a fish's duty is to feed humans. So I don't know if Robin is aware of the documentaries *Sea Spiracy* and uh, and *End of the Line*. Maybe uh, Robin is 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 unschooled in the thought of fisheries management. Maybe she hasn't heard uh, about the latest fishery that was closed down. Uh, but anyway, all of this talk about, uh, you know, gratitude and reciprocity uh, Oh boy, where uh, is this? Uh, good Lord, I have so many passages here. Oh no, I I had this passage marked, and then I guess now I I cannot find it. Oh boy. This is, um, oh, Jesus, I am sorry, people. Um, well, this was a major part of this rant, and now I cannot find the passage that I, 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 I wanted to read. I think this is... The uh, the uh, the universe telling me not to put this rant. I had the goddamn thing uh, marked, and now it is gone forever. Uh, anyway, this is what you get. Uh, but but what it was, uh, I, I I I I can. Uh, I, I am very sorry. I can't find the damn passage. I had it marked, and, and but anyway, it's a 450-page book. Uh, but what it was is she was telling this story. Maybe this will keep me from getting a copyright violation. Uh, she was telling this story 
uh, about taking her students on a field trip, and they were, and, and you know, they were gathering cattails. Oh Jesus! I really need to find this. Uh, I am I am so pissed at myself right now, guys. I, I mean, I should be able to see where the page was folded down, and I because it was the most important passage that I had marked, and like a clueless moron. Uh, I unfolded the page, but I'm not going to start this rant over. It's like uh, the universe uh, is telling me, Sam, you're getting yourself deeper and deeper uh, into this. You need to stop while you're behind. But anyway, it was about cattails and, uh, and, and, and how she was teaching her students about nature's bounty and stuff, and one of her students called her on her shit, uh, saying, you know, uh, Professor, I'm calling you on your shit, that you, 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 you can't tell me that giving these, uh, that sprinkling a little bit of uh, tobacco uh, on uh, in thanks of all of this bounty. Uh, anyway, guys, I am very sorry. I I screwed up here because it was my about my favorite passage out of the entire book, which I can't share with you. So you need to read it yourself. So, but what she talks about from there is that she, you know, how she's talking to some of these other noble savage uh, elders. And, and, and so one of these guys says, well, you, you know, all you can do is give gratitude. That's all you need to do is say, thank you very much, planet, uh, for all you've given me. And, and to pretend like, uh, you know, this guy was telling her this, this other noble savage elder said, if, you, you know, for you to pretend like that humans on any level, on any level, can reciprocate uh, and, and give back to this planet a, a, a tiny fraction of what humans take for it is it, just absolute arrogance. It, it, it is the picture of human-centric arrogance uh, to hold this thought. And she goes, well, while I appreciate the humility uh, of, of his comment, uh, she argues with him. And, uh, and, and she says that, in fact, uh, humans can, uh, can give back to this planet as much as they have taken from the planet, which is an absurd statement on the face of it any college student, uh, any Native American noble savage elder knows damn well that anybody making this claim is a clueless moron uh, to claim that, that humans can reciprocate uh, what they have taken uh, from this planet. But anyway, guys, uh, it, it, you, will, you won't be surprised that, uh, you, you know, towards the very end where, you know, she's sounding more and more and more and more and more like a Doomer chick. She's a, the woman's a great Doomer chick if she would just take it to the end. But uh, obviously what she, what she just makes sure you want to understand is that she is not a Doomer. Okay, and she gets right on the uh, anti-Doomer bandwagon uh, towards the end of the book. This is uh, Robin on, uh, on why she is not a Doomer. Despair is paralysis. It robs us of agency. It blinds us to our own 
power and the power of the earth. Hmm. Environmental despair is a poison every bit as destructive as the methylated mercury in the bottom of Onondaga Lake. But how can we submit to despair while the land is saying, help! Restoration is a powerful antidote to despair. Restoration offers concrete means by which humans can once again enter into positive, creative relationship with the more than human world, meeting responsibilities that are simultaneously material and spiritual. And again, I, I am a huge fan of restoration. Uh, as I, I guess she's using restoration as, uh, as her main example of reciprocity. Well, what the hell are we restoring? What we're restoring are all of the ecosystems that were destroyed by humans going all the way back to the first wetland that was destroyed by Sky Woman. If humans had never fallen from the sky, th th there would be no global ecosystems to restore. So is it showing reciprocity by simply fixing the damage that we caused? If, if, if this is her, if this is her main example, once again uh, she fails. But it is uh, it, it is this sentence here, of course, that uh, that will drive any doomer into paralytic despair. Take it away, Robin. It's not enough to grieve. It's not enough to just stop doing bad things. It is not enough, according to Robin, to just stop doing bad things. Well, Robin, I got some bad news for you, girl. It is enough to stop. To stop. Okay? The planet, our fellow earthlings, don't want your little tobacco sprinkles. They don't want your swallow of coffee. They want you to stop. Stop it. Cut the shit. It is enough to stop. This is the, the central flaw in, in, in her argument. Well, other than never mentioning overshoot or overpopulation one time in 400 pages, putting that aside, it most certainly is enough to stop. That is the only thing that Mother earth wants from us. She doesn't want you braiding sweet grass and smudging sweet grass and, and, and all of this happy horse shit. She wants us to stop. There is one way that an individual human is going to reciprocate to Mother Earth by stopping the damage and that is to die. That is the one individual action, well, and then not breeding, uh, the one individual action we can do to show reciprocity and gratitude to Mother Earth is to die. And the number one thing that humans can do uh, as a species to show reciprocity and gratitude to this planet is to go extinct. That is the only way humans are going to stop uh, this attack on this planet and our fellow Earthlings. That started when Sky Woman fell out, uh, out of the world. And that now, of course, the single best way to stop, 
to stop uh, is to never start doing bad things to the planet. There is one way a human can never do a bad thing to this planet, and that is to never be born. Which is why breeding, which I think she did three, I think she has three children, uh, why, why breeding is, is the one thing you can do, I mean not breeding is the one thing you can do to show gratitude and reciprocity to this planet in your own life is to prevent any other human from ever starting doing bad things. But anyway, you know, since she started uh, with a creation myth, uh, towards the very last act, she uh, closes with this absolutely hilarious. I, I might have to do a separate reading on the Mayan creation myth. So she's, since she started with a noble savage cre creation myth, she chooses to pretty much close with one. I, I can't take the time to read it. So what she is talking about is is the gods who created the Mayan uh, race, I guess. Uh, they, they kept screwing up. Everything they try, every time they tried to make a human, uh, the humans just kept screwing up things. So the gods had to come by and, and destroy their, uh, destroy them that whatever they were doing, uh, the gods had to reach down and slap them down and basically send them into collapse. So the fourth try, so God tries three times, so the fourth time, I guess God or the gods uh, decides now he, she, it, they are going to uh, make humans out of corn, which is very interesting how you make something, how you make a, the original human out of corn when it is humans who invented corn. Of course, corn being one of the uh, biggest threats to the planet that humans have ever come up with. I, I, I love how God fed the corn people on corn liquor and oh, these were good people. Yes, they were. So we have a bunch of hillbillies getting uh, drunk on good corn liquor. And she wraps up talking about the Mayan Indians. These people of corn are the ones who were respectful and grateful for the world that sustained them. And so they, meaning the Mayans, were the people who were sustained upon the earth. <laughs> there you go. I wish uh, Robin could have been with me in Playa del Carmen, uh, Mexico, a couple of weeks ago, looking at this, uh, this absolutely downtrodden, beaten down, humiliated, Mayan, it was either a little girl or a grown woman just, just huddling on the sidewalk in absolute abject despair, uh, holding out her little plastic cup, begging uh, from these rich, clueless, moron tourists. Oh, Jesus. I just, I, 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 I just feel sorry uh, for these. So anyway, guys, if you are a doomer, you need to approach this book very carefully, very gingerly approach uh, braiding sweet grass, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants very carefully, but uh, one more reason 
We Are Doomed braiding sweetgrass. So I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go smudge. I'm gonna go smudge this overflowing storage shed full of planted eating crap with some braided sweet grass to show reciprocity uh, and absolve myself uh, of my own guilt for uh, my own part in uh, taking down this planet. Miss little dog, are you enjoying your new collar of braided sweet grass? Get out there and braid some sweet grass while you still can. Bye guys. Oh uh, yes, braiding sweet grass. <laughs> we are going to go braid some sweet grass. Oh, Jesus. Get me out of here. My gosh.